Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. Praising God in a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of our Lord. In the passage that we just read, we find Jesus on the border between Samaria and Galilee. In Samaria lived Samaritans. And in Galilee lived Galileans who were Jews. And Jews and Samaritans refused to have dealings with one another. There was a lot of mutual animosity between the two groups. But it's very interesting in this story that common misfortune had broken down the racial and the national borders between them. There was at least one Samaritan in this group, along with the Jewish gentleman. Kind of made me think of wild animals. If there is a flood or a fire, animals will run to safety. If there's a flood, you'll find all kinds of animals gathered together on the high point of land, where they'll stay out of the water, avoid being drowned. Animals that would normally fight and devour one another are able to share that space in times of crisis. Or in a fire, a similar thing will happen. If there's a forest fire or a prairie fire, wild animals will run to the river or to the lake and you'll find uh, you know, foxes and rabbits in the water side by side. Nobody gets eaten. Common misfortune sometimes is the thing that brings people together. Over the last four weeks, we talked about the theme of togetherness. Together. One thing that should pull us together is a common need. A common need for God and His salvation. Now in Jesus' time, Lepers were required to keep their distance. It tells us in Luke's Gospel that they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They couldn't come close. They weren't allowed to come close because of their illness. There was a great fear that it was contagious, that if they got close, others might get the disease. These people were utterly isolated from society, even from their own families. And so they banded together to share life, a desperate life it was. These ten lepers came with a desperate, desperate <coughs> need. And Jesus healed them. He met their need. He healed all ten. But only one came back to say thanks. How often have you asked for something, and when you got it, you never came back to say thank you? Those two little words, thank you, should be spoken often. Yes. To parents, to other people, but especially to God. Today is Thanksgiving Sunday. Tomorrow is a national holiday, set apart as a day for the giving of thanks. Sadly, for many people, Thanksgiving Day has simply become Turkey Day. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating turkey. That's not my point. But 
Thanksgiving is the reason and the purpose and the most important one to thank is the God who created us, who redeemed us, who loves us and provides for us daily. So, it's not just the, the words, thank you, that are important, but the attitude behind the words. Not just on Thanksgiving Day, but every day. We have so much for which to be grateful. Seek to live each day with an attitude of gratitude. I want you to listen again to the reading from Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned, received, or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will you know, when I wake up in the morning, my feet don't even touch the floor until I pray a prayer. I am so grateful for each day. And I realize that as I go into the day, I need to go with an attitude that is pleasing to Jesus. Sometimes my prayer time in bed is short. Some days when I wake up very early, it's long. But it's so important that we start each day with God. Allow Him to give you an attitude adjustment. Make sure that your mental and emotional thermostat is set on positive. In his letter to the church in the city of Philippi, Paul has a great deal to say about our attitudes. Why? Because God is every bit as concerned with our attitudes as he is with our actions. Philippians 4.4 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. When I read that verse, I'm struck by the fact that this is not just a suggestion. This is a command. And if you are like me, it may be a command that is difficult to keep all the time. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Whenever Scripture repeats something, you know that that's for emphasis. God wants to draw your special attention to it. Thank you, Doris, for reminding us of the importance of joy. It should be a characteristic of our lives. Amen. I will say it again. Rejoice. The Bible tells you that you must be happy. There is a terrible cost to a refusal to be a joyful person. I found a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 47 that says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity, therefore in hunger and thirst and nakedness and dire poverty, you will serve the enemies the Lord sends against you. Did you get that? If you are unwilling to serve the Lord with joy and gladness, you're going to have to serve your enemies. You can tell a person's relationship to God, not by their theology, not by the number of Bible verses they can quote, but by their kindness and their joy. A lot of people have great theology, but they don't seem to know God. You don't see it. Larry Osborne says, the most important trait to look for is spiritual warmth. By that I mean a growing relationship with Jesus. It is absolutely essential. No amount of giftedness, knowledge, or people skills can compensate for its absence. 
I want to be more like Jesus. And I am pretty sure that you do, too. Philippians 2, verse 5 tells us, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. In the newest version of the NIV, it's paraphrased this way. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Wow, what a high standard. It's only possible when the spirit of Jesus is living and in control of your life. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Pray about <coughs> everything, in every situation. We can pray about our past our present, and our future. We pray forgiveness for our past, help we need in the present, and guidance for the future. And when you pray, always pray with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving must be the universal accompaniment to prayer. We believe that God is working all things together for the good of those who love Him. Therefore, we come to Him in perfect submission to his will. When we are confident of the love of God and the wisdom of God and the power of God, then we experience the peace of God which transcends all understanding. God's peace protects our hearts and our minds like a soldier standing on guard. Listen.